welcome. Uh, first of all, I, I want to introduce myself and, and my guest here. My name is uh, Pirmin Fessler. I'm, I'm working at the Austrian Central Bank for the Economic Microdata Lab. And I'm working mostly on the HFCS, which is the Household Finance and Consumption Survey, which is a survey about household <laughs> finance. And uh, this is by, la by far actually the, the most comprehensive survey in, in Europe. And our guest today, uh, where I feel very honored to be able to interview him, and uh, that's why I'm also very excited, I have to say, is, is Arsa Kenical. Um, Arsa is deeply connected with the Household Finance and Consumption Survey for, for several reasons. We in Austria owe Arsa a lot because our survey wouldn't have been feasible at the level of quality as it is today uh, without Arsa. Arsa helped uh, us and actually the whole uh, Euro system uh, to develop the HFCS and it is still in, in Austria but also in many other European countries the only survey we can rely on when we talk about the distribution of assets and liabilities of, of households. Arsa is uh, a giant and uh, many <laughs> researchers uh, stand on his shoulders maybe without knowing it. Um, Andrea Brandolini uh, once said about you that uh, you have a rare blend of attention to details and ability to paint the broad picture. So in the 70s, uh, Arsa worked with other famous statisticians like uh, Donald Rubin and, and Fritz Scheuren on uh, multiple imputations, which are, is a very complex tool, statistically new, needed for this type of surveys. And then in the 80s, he became uh, uh, Mr. Survey of Consumer Finances. He, he uh, developed the Survey of Consumer Finance uh, in the US at the Fed and created what I would call uh, the Ultimate Wealth Survey, um, which was then copied by many other countries. And, and Arthur uh, consulted a lot of these countries, including um, the Euro area countries, to develop their own uh, surveys all around the world all based on the model of the Survey of Consumer Finances. And uh, he's one of the most influential uh, statisticians of our time, I would say, for sure. For sure, the most important person uh, with regard to, to wealth surveys. So with, without further ado, I want to start. Uh, Arthur, um, can you tell us a, a little bit uh, about your life? I mean, what brought you uh, towards economics, what brought you towards measurement, uh, how did you end up uh, doing the survey of consumer finance and later the HFCS, uh, what were the major challenges to, to end up there? So I don't know really how, first of all I should say you're just way too kind to me and, and I didn't actually start the survey of consumer finance. As the, it was, I came to the Federal Reserve in 1984 and the 83 survey had already been done. Um, I think in retrospect, that was more like a pretest for the main survey. And I think my real contribution was to try to systematize things in 19, by the 1989 survey, to try to build a firmer foundation, a firmer methodological foundation for the whole thing. And you know, based on observations of what happened in the earlier survey. So I just wanna, I wanted to be clear about that first. But you know, I don't know, if, really how far back to go in time to answer your question, but I think, you know, really to understand my perspective, I have to go back uh, a bit to where I grew up. I grew up in, uh, <clears throat> in, in a town in Georgia, in the U.S., Savannah, and it's a, it's a really beautiful town. It, there's, uh, there's a lot of great architecture there. It's very well known now, and it wasn't so well known then. There was a lot of decay of this beautiful old architecture, and there was this gorgeous nature and, and what people would call swamps, which is a, really not a, the right way to describe these beautiful grasslands in the, in the tidal areas. And, and so it, it was a place of incredible natural beauty, um, but it was also a place where there were a lot of really bad attitudes about people and about life in general. And at the same time in my life, there were people that to me represented 
something of just the really the highest order of meaning and integrity and yet these people were also polluted by all of these bad things so this 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 really something fundamental i feel in my life about coming from a place that's so beautiful where there's so many things of this sort that that mix together and and there was a there was a poet I met one time from, uh, I think from Mississippi, and she was someone who had had just terrible challenges in her area, including having her children taken away from her and really awful things of that sort. And, <clears throat> and I remarked to her that we both came from places that had this very ingrown kind of organic swamp-like structure. And I said that, you know, what you see when you go into the swamp is that there are all these creatures that try to consume things. Sometimes they're alligators and things of that sort. And, but you know, out of this, this overheated mixture of things, these, these incredible flowers will bloom or other structures will bloom. And I think that that's, that's the model of that is something that's really deep in my thought process that, that there's, this, there's this constant mixture of complex things around you and, and attitudes, some of which are perverse and some of which are really positive. But you, know, you can find things in that that have this, this aspect of, you know, I wouldn't say anything remotely like truth, but, but beauty in a way, whether it be abstract in terms of measurement or, or artwork or, or personal relationships or anything of that sort. But that's, uh, that's something that's really deep in my, my way of thinking. So I, was, uh, I went to college at the University of Chicago and I st started out to be a physics major. And, and I found that uh, that was really interesting, but I just could not stand the people who were the leaders in that field. I just found, with a few exceptions, it was just not a group of people I would ever want to spend my life with. And I went through some very difficult times trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I, I, was, uh, I was doing artwork at this time as well. And that was a, a big part of what, I was, what, I, what was fulfilling for me then. And uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I reached a point in that life where I felt that I'm, I'm really not very good at putting myself forward. I don't really like to do that. I don't like to be the center of attention. So even this is kind of uncomfortable for me. I've never done this before. And, and that's, that's not a good position to be in if you're an artist, because you have to be in the world and pushing all the time to get anywhere. And, and I knew I was not going to be good at that. And I knew that I needed to do something because I didn't want to wind up being one of those terribly disappointed people. And I was living <clears throat> in Washington at that time, and I happened to meet a lot of economists. And I saw that economists get to do a really interesting range of things. I didn't see, at that point, I didn't see the more narrow academic world of economics, but I saw the kind of social policy issues, the kind of measurement issues, all of this constellation of things that economists can do. And that was appealing to me. And without ever having had a single real economics course, I applied to graduate school in economics. And, uh, and it was really amusing looking back on my college career once I was in graduate school. Because the University of Chicago has this model where they, they want you to be exposed to enough aspects of, 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 of life in a scientific context and a or maybe not always scientific, but a structured context to, to be an informed and capable citizen. And, and I had one class that, uh, that was called um, Social Science, some, some number, I forget. I don't think it had a name. I mean, it was a democracy and freedom and democracy or probably something like that. And, and we were studying Locke and Aristotle and Plato and just a whole range, and even St. Augustine. And, and, and there was one day when these books arrived from the Federal Reserve. This box was in the classroom and the teacher came in. We were all excited because we knew it was something for us and he opened it. 
and it was a book called Functions and Purposes of the Federal Reserve System. And it was all about how central banking works and, and fractional reserve monetary structures and that sort of thing. And, and we read that and it was very interesting and we didn't necessarily see what that had to do with the other things that we were reading, but it was very interesting and the teacher made it very compelling. And then somewhat later, we, we were introduced to Adam Smith, but not the Wealth of Nations. It was the theory of moral sentiment. And that was very interesting. That made a more direct connection. So looking back on this, I saw that what they exposed us to was the two things from the Chicago School's point of view that are most important, monetary policy and the invisible hand. So, so I'm in graduate school and um, you know, graduate school is, is not fun for most people. And, and it was, I, I managed to find my way toward uh, things that I thought were interesting. I started out thinking I would work in international economics because I'm just interested in, in varieties of people. I like that kind of exposure and connection. And I discovered that international economics was not even remotely what I thought it was at the time and I found it terribly uninteresting. And so I began looking around and this was at a time when micro macro stuff was just beginning to be acceptable and and this was something appealing to me because the idea of macro is is so you know you really want to be able to say things of that sort but when you look at the assumptions that are made particularly this whole representative consumer aspect and at the time you didn't even have like you have now where they're you know, uninformed and informed agents and all these other perturbations of that model, but it just, it didn't seem to me to be defensible. I wanted to find a way to defend it and I tried thinking about it in terms of statistical mechanics and that sort of thing. And I think someone still could make progress in that area, but I, but I couldn't. And, and I became interested in micro data and I wound up writing this thesis on basically some aspects of life cycle savings. And, but in order to do this and feel like I really, you know, that it was doing something that had any meaning at all, I had to dig into the foundations of measurement and wound up reading books on sampling theory and that sort of stuff. Because you, you have these data, well, when you go out and you talk to people and you get some data, what is that supposed to mean? And so I, so I had to dig into that, and, you know, and it gave me, a, it gave me a foundation for thinking about another way of looking at uh, you know, what we euphemistically might call reality. And, uh, and so that, uh, that became quite interesting to me, this whole process of observation, measurement, um, and, this, and so I, then I finished my PhD, and I go on the job market, and, and in the end, the most appealing job to me was one at the Federal Reserve, not because it initially allowed me to work on what I wound up working on, but because the person who interviewed me was someone who was really brilliant, Peter Tinsley, a really, really brilliant man. He's, he's gone now, but a, a really brilliant man. And talking with him was so exciting because you'd have to concentrate very hard in order to follow his discussions because he would make, be making connections between things all over the place. And that was, that was really great. And, and I had the, the he, was, he was in charge of this group that was doing sort of unconventional macro work, very, some of it very unconventional. But one of the things was doing these um, stochastic simulations of quarterly models and that was what I first started working on. And they had had this model that was built on, I think really at a flimsy foundation. And or not the macro model, I did, that's, that's, you know, that's really dealing with things that I don't, I don't really necessarily um, find intellectually appealing. But the, but the simulation aspect, I thought the error structure of it was pretty interesting. And I built models to try to deal with that. And I think this brought me to the attention of some other people, particularly in my section. There was someone by the name of Paul Spent, who's a monetary economist, but who was really interested in, uh, in, in measurement. 
and we worked together on a survey of currency and transaction account use. And at that time, there was very limited information on where the currency was in the US and what people's banking practices at that detail level might be. And so I worked on that. And then I became known as someone who, and I figured out things like some, some things related to imputation and so forth, getting into some of the technical details and the, and the interface you know, with the, the, the person that you collect the data from and, and, and through, the interviewer. Um, and that, uh, that brought me to the attention of the people who were working on this very first version of the Survey of Consumer Finances. And it was there that I felt like I, my, my career really blossomed because I had a medium in which to operate where you know, I could deal with the people, I could deal with the words, I could deal with the mathematical structure. And, and all of that, and that's, so that's, that's where that came from. I think that uh, touches, uh, touches exactly on the next thing I want to talk about, namely uh, measurement itself. I mean, you, you already uh, said how important it is to you, and I think that's something we have in, in common. And what fascinates me always is that basically as human beings, we have this input through our senses, uh, kind of measurement, and create some reality in, in our brains. Yes. And that's also what we do as a basic uh, operation in the survey and uh, then we create uh, some reality uh, out of that and uh, we, we then off I mean we call it scientific if we use certain tools standardized tools and methods to do so but um, why are we so interested in specifically household finance can you elaborate on that why why is that something uh, where it's so important to take care of, of measurement the process of measurement so the I think first it's best to talk about the need for the data. Um, you know, if we, if we care about the welfare of people, and I, you know, I hope that, that on average we do, um, uh, and that, that governments do on average care about the real welfare of people, then you need to know about the condition of people in the world and, and managing policy to the extent that that happens in the interest of, of, of individual welfare, it ought to be informed by the, by the reality of the people that are affected by it. And, you know, particularly people who are very poor or people who are not financially literate and, um, or people that are affected by things like big interest rate policies, you, need, you really need to understand how these channels play out through real human beings so that I think this is just so important that it not be some macro abstraction that it's capital C and capital I and all of this. It's really people. And maybe you can't say, you know, Bill and Joe and Alice and so forth, but to say that at least these groups of people or people who are in this sort of conditional group or affected in some way, I think to have that connection to reality or a, an abstraction of reality is really important for, for anything that, that operates on the, on the world. And I think it's also important, you know, maybe this is just my own kind of romantic notion, but I think, I think that it, it's important to try to document the history of people I, I really, and that's one of the things I tried to give interviewers as motivation when people weren't swayed by the idea that this informs policy and all these other kinds of things that you normally tell respondents to make them feel good about it, that it's, in, the, in our case, I would say, this is the history of the American people, and you're providing your input to the history of this country. And people will look back on this and they will see this is how it was in the financial sense for people who lived in the world then. And I, I do think that that's, it's important. And, and people will, you know, researchers later will look at this from a variety of angles. They may use it as, you know, cohort data and analyze it in terms of econometric models. Or it may be people who are historians or sociologists who look back and try to understand the structural evolution of a country. I, see. I mean, often the processes are quite separated. So there are people producing the data yes. and then the researchers analyzing the data. To what degree do you think it's important for a researcher to also understand how, how the data actually was created or produced? Well, I think every researcher can't 
probably can't uh, work directly with the creation because I think the varying abilities and interests and all of that. But it's, I believe it's important for people to have at least some notion about where their data came from. And this is, I mean, I'm sure you know very well, it's, it's a struggle to get people to pay attention to that. There's just too much of a reflex to say, that's what the variable says, that's what it is, and you know, forget all of this nicety about this qualification and that qualification, this is what it is. And, and we know perfectly well some of the limitations of the data or, or how sometimes what appears to be one way in the data is really means something else, and the, the yeah. something else can be much more interesting. Yeah, I agree. To go back to the content of the data itself, of the SCF, but also the HFCS, I mean, the central banks uh, use it mostly for reasons of financial stability, of course, but also monetary policy transmission, things like that. So, but in the general public, it's also often, of course, about wealth inequality, mm -hmm. right? And we talked already today in your lecture yes. about the issues with that, that the data is not perfect for that, and that there are, new, uh, there are a lot of methods around to, to deal with that. And one uh, method which um, uh, is heavily used recently is this, uh, or one approach is this measurement of the top shares mm -hmm. to, to look at wealth concentration. And I, I'm personally, as you know, I'm very skeptical of that because it, it kind of, it is the weak spot of the data yes. and then we use additional assumptions to, to do this. Yeah? And it kind of also hides that we don't know very much about the, about the top shares of the, of the very wealthy people. So my question would be, in general, what do you think of the current state of research on, on wealth inequality and, and what would be interesting uh, avenues to, to, to look at, to go for? Well, personally, I find it much more interesting and important to worry about the state of poor people than about rich people. And I, I know that there are definitely reasons to care about the, the very wealthy people, but the thing that really should be most pressing on our conscience is the state of people who are not very well off. And I would like to see much more attention among economists focused on that end of the spectrum. There is this, uh, you know, as we saw in the presentation that Isabel Martinez made this morning, where he, she showed pictures of the Swiss, uh, I forget the name of it, but the magazine that's the equivalent of Forbes that has the, the, rich, the annual rich list. It's like celebrity photographs. And, and it's not that all the academics who are doing work on this are, are you know, chasing people with flash bulbs and, or, or watching the equivalent of lifestyles of the rich and famous. I think there's a sincere interest in trying to understand that population. But in, for a variety of reasons, I think it's just, I think it may be overdone, not unimportant, but overdone. And, and in part for the reason that you mentioned that, that we don't really know that much. And, and there are good reasons why we don't know that much. I mean, as, as you know really well, it's very hard, sometimes impossible to get data from people who were extraordinarily wealthy. I mean, why would they spend their time participating in a survey? I mean, if, you have, if you have $20 billion, why would you care to have an interviewer sit and waste your, your million dollar a minute time? So you agree to, that a better option would be a wealth register or something? Like well, that. a wealth register would be very helpful. Um, you know, short of that, and that may be possible in some places. I think where, where it is possible, it would be really nice there there's certainly political obstacles to that, a variety of political obstacles, but, but that would be best. And short of that, I think we have to accept that some aspect of approximation is necessary if we want to say something about that population. And as, as you also know really well, in the Household Finance and Consumption Survey, there are surveys for each of the Eurozone countries, and these surveys try to apply as common a methodology as possible. And I think that they, you know, as I was saying to you this morning, I think that they, they um, you know, everyone makes a really strong effort to try to do the right thing. There's still some convergence that's necessary to be reached on, on basic and solidly agreed framework. 
But the significant problem is this upper tail of the distribution. Some countries like Spain have wealth tax data they can use to align the survey and sample from the wealthy and to align with the wealthy. And some of the Nordic countries have register data. And this is really great because they can just sample directly from registers, but most countries don't. And, and so the measurement of the upper tail is so wildly different across countries. And, and yet when people make estimates, they'll estimate top shares for all these different countries and compare them as if that comparison meant something. And I believe fundamentally it doesn't mean anything or it means very little. I mean, it means something, but only in the most indirect kind of sense. And with some, some kind of approximation, if you don't have registered data, is necessary. So I'm sure, I mean, we agree that it will be very hard, if, if not impossible, to get through a survey the data on the very wealthy, which would be, of course, important to have. But then, um, more broadly, I mean, we have a lot of different data available. A lot of data is created today through many processes like social media, the internet, but also registers of the state or private firms. So can you briefly elaborate on, on why do we actually still need these kind of uh, statistical surveys uh, with the goal of statistical analysis? Why can we not just uh, use the big data which is available? Well, I think two things. One is that uh, you know, outside of a total surveillance police state, you, you can't know enough about people in order to really to uh, to, to, to provide context for the situation. You know, maybe you can know from, from some kind of big data or, or, or administrative data of some, or, or private, private data of some sort, something about uh, you know, people's bank balances or, or stocks or businesses or something of that sort, but you, you don't have the context information. I think the other really big problem is that these are, basically what statisticians call convenience samples. There's no probability structure to it. You don't really know what it represents. This is the case with some of these internet panels that are just, they're voluntary and, and they go on forever. And you know, who, do they, who do they represent? I have no idea. <laughs> and those, are, those are really important problems. People try to work on this representativeness issue, but it's, it's kind of like survey weighting, where they, they take you know, demographic characteristics and do calibration of population groups to, to, from, the, from that sample of data to, to aggregate numbers. But you know, there could be all kinds of non-random selection within those groups that maybe doesn't matter for some things, but I bet it matters an awful lot for things like wealth. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean. Uh... I'm also con actually concerned, and I wonder what you think about that, that uh, it's also, it gets more and more difficult to do this kind of surveys just because there are these cheap alternatives like using internet samples or, or, or like whatever kind of convenience uh, samples. So um, do you have any idea I mean, how to convince uh, people to, uh, that we really need this money to have benchmarks uh, to have some idea about uh, the representative joint distributions of exactly the context. Yes. Because for our models, we need the context, especially in economic models, we often have a lot of context, like right? age, education, expectations, and a lot of things. Well, I think as long as people aren't willing to say, we don't care about, uh, we don't care about the situation of people, and unless they're willing to say that, I don't really see an alternative to surveys. Uh, there's just, surveys have many problems, and I think there are ways of addressing those problems. Administrative data, to me, is the most important thing for helping surveys, and the ability of, of um, surveys under all the appropriate precautions to protect people's privacy, to be able to link to administrative data would bring the benefit of being able to see more clearly the non-randomness of, of non-random effects that take place in sampling and surveys and identify non-response problems could uh, could certainly in some cases replace measures that are gathered in surveys um, and I, to me that's 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 just an essential step forward for surveys to 
survive as something that's both uh, affordable and meaningful. So you would see them as complementary yes. to, the, yes. to the survey, which yes. stay as a benchmark for this target population, yes. and you add administrative data to the yes. survey information. And there, there are other reasons too, but I think that's, those are the... Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I just want to ask you a question about science in, in general. <laughs> many, I mean, many people, and unfortunately also some empirical uh, scientists themselves have this kind of naive idea that we, uh, that we have simple hypotheses, then we bring them to the data, and then they are falsified or not, and we keep those who are not falsified, and that's kind of how we converge to some, some truth. And I, it seems often that they don't um, recognize that we have a lot of standardized methods and we can have uh, results which are at the same time valid but might contradict each other. And that's something very difficult to, uh, to understand for people outside of the process. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, briefly explain how you see uh, the actual practical work of our field in this context uh, with regard to scientific progress? And, and how would you uh, convince people that this uh, practical work is something important for, for society to progress? Hmm. Um, so, you know, I think that, that uh, we see in science this, uh, this uh, possibility of paradigm shifts. People go along for a long time assuming a certain model of reality and, and begin accumulating imperfections or other kinds of irregularities until those accumulate into something that winds up changing people's point of view. And that's certainly something that we see flowing aside all of this uh, thing that goes back to Francis Bacon of, you know, the, this simple method of, of proof, or, or not of proof, of, of the disproving things, trying to dis, disprove things, because you can only go so far in that direction. I think the the, one of the problems is that, you know, in, in, in fields like physics where there's, there, there we have every reason to believe that there's some kind of underlying structure that has more of a regularity to it than, than we have in human experience. And the human experience has just a, a almost infinitely larger possibility of variation. Um, and the kind of way of thinking that applies in a world where you, where you have such replicable structure is very different from what we have in social science. And I think it, the, the, to me it makes it more important to focus on the things that are, that are granular and, and particularly things that are irregular. I remember once Alan Greenspan said to me something really interesting. He said, uh, you know, people People, I don't think it's violating any pledges to say this. He, he said that you know, people are always trying to take things and remove the irregularities from it before they show it to me, but they don't realize that what I really care about is the things that are different. That really teaches me something. Yeah, yeah. Um, with respect to that, actually, talking about granular and more aggregate statistics, uh, we, we share both another concern, I think, namely that of the misuse of, mm -hmm. of things we put out there, of the data we put out there. And you, I'm sure you are aware of this uh, T G20 data gaps initiatives, where we also in the Euro system um, produce this distributional wealth account. So we, we use our granular data to come up with a, a, with a time series. Of course, a lot of assumptions are involved, again, interpolation, extrapolation, and then finally we give them or give the public or the scientists a, a, a time series. Most of it, of course, based on heavy assumptions. Yes. So we, we produce something from the granular without knowing uh, the uncertainty around it and things like that. So what do you think about the, the benefits, of course, and the potential uh, problems with, with such time series created uh, being easily uh, available? I guess I'm, I tend to be rather skeptical of it, and to me it seems to fit into this, this same model of um, <clears throat> what I think of as, as just too much focus on the upper tail of the distribution, that you know, I, maybe it's some passing phase in society that we, that we want to care in that way about these things, but I, I'm just not, it's not clear to me that, it, that, that translating what we see in the survey data into the aggregate, aggregate, aggregate accounts 
is a substantial improvement. And I can understand why people want it. And I understand that people build these models that you know, try to make better macro models that take account of different groups. And you know, maybe that's worthwhile. I'm not a macroeconomist in that sense. So you know, maybe I don't have a good feel about that. But I do, I'm skeptical just on a variety of grounds, methodological as well as substantive. I just want to dwell a little bit on this thought you have that we, we put too much weight on the, to look at the tail of the distribution. And I wonder, isn't that something which is already in, inside our statistics? Like think of GDP, like it's a sum of income. So if you have more income, you have more weight in GDP. All our society and economics is focused on increasing GDP growth. So, and implicitly, the, the people with more income just have more weight. So all our policies are more catering to the people with more income. Isn't that something which is in a lot of statistics we actually... Oh, of course, yeah. And, and, and a lot of that is missing in our survey data. Yeah. Uh, but the strength of the survey data is the ability to focus on the other people. And, yeah. and if we really care, again, if we really care about the welfare of most people, we don't need to be worried directly about the upper tail. We can worry about corruption and political influence and environmental destruction and all kinds of issues that are associated with the, with the really rich. You know, it's short of a world where, you know, people are re where, where wealthy people are reducing everyone else to serfs. I think it's not, it's not quite as urgent and it's not unimportant. It's really not unimportant at all, but it's just so much more important to worry about the welfare of ordinary people. I just, if the same energy could be focused on ordinary people, I'd be a lot happier. <laughs> um, um, yeah, actually the, my next question fits perfectly to, to this idea. I mean, the, the public discourse, mm -hmm. uh, especially with regard to, to household finance, but, but also I would say even worse with regard to topics in, of income and wealth distribution. Um, the, the level of quality, at least in Austria, is really very low, unfortunately. So in the media, instead of experts in the field, it is mainly dominated, uh, the discourse is dominated by, by lobbyists and other people representing certain groups uh, in society. So the, the share of, of misleading and false information is really large. And I, I just wonder, what is your experience with regard to, to this problem in the US? Does it exist? And, and if so, um, do you have ideas how we should deal with that, or should we even deal with that, or should we as scientists no, like not so much care about that? Gosh, I think if anyone could really deal with the way things are right now, they would, be, they would become immediately so incredibly wealthy as to <laughs> just be astonishing, because I think this is, this is one of the biggest problems of our era, that we we have this way of communicating now that's so easy and human beings being the way they are and the way our brains operate, there's, there's a kind of, I think in all of us there's a kind of latent paranoia structure that, you know, and it, and it comes I'm sure out of our evolution that you need to be worried about the saber-toothed tiger around the corner or the moral equivalent and so you, you need to be careful but, but it, it just makes people amplify things that are you know when you when you're able to know what's really going on things that are things that just are so absurd and to try to stop this seems uh, almost impossible and and that's a kind of depressing thought to have and I don't I don't like that and I think it's necessary to push back against that and probably we can do more I think if we People say that one of the problems is that people who know about an area often appear condescending to other people. And you know, maybe, I don't know, but you know, maybe if we show, show more humility about what we know, uh, it might, and, and really make a point of connecting to people about the things that matter to them, maybe we can change this discourse. It's not going to be something easy because they just they're too as you say there are too many vested interests the lobbyists the people the you know the big money that's the reason to worry about the big money this influence the the corruption and the political influence those are the those are the problems yeah, so generally speaking i mean uh, i think i read that somewhere but but i thought a lot about it so the the information the amount of information readily available for sure increased dramatically but the question is isn't the share 
of valid information out of this information, is that also increasing or not? So as a, as a sampling guy, you know what would happen if the share of valid information might decrease at the same time when the total information increases. So it might be very difficult actually uh, to steer this process in a, in, a, in a good direction. I think if we give up <clears throat> on the idea of bringing a, a, a some variety of scientific approach to measurement that we're in for a very dark period. I think losing track of reality is not something we want to do. You know, someone, you know, maybe you can't convince everyone of the state of reality, but you really cannot let that go dark. That would be, I believe, catastrophic. I mean, more and more people do not really believe uh, in, in, in facts created by scientific methods. Um, so they, they use other methods, let's say, <laughs> let's call them other methods to come up with alternative realities. And um, they are often repeated and reinforced through, you, you touched on that, social media, echo chambers, uh, bubbles and so on. Uh, as, a, as a scientific facts guy as you are, what is your take on this development as a whole? I mean, uh, why do you think we got here? And uh, is, the, is the construct of, of a reality based on, on science, so basically certain common standards and methods to produce facts, is that uh, getting difficult to accept for people? And if so, why? Yes, that's a, <clears throat> that's a very good question. I think, first of all, let's just say a little bit more about, about social science. You know, there's, um, and as I said before, I think the, the nature of social science and physical sciences is, is quite different. And I think in social science, disagreement is really important and it needs to be open and informed disagreement. One of my, one of my favorite uh, authors is the British poet and artist William Blake and he has this, this piece called The Proverbs of, of Hell. And one of my favorite ones is uh, a, a, um, a, a proverb, opposition is true friendship. <clears throat> and if you really disagree with something, you're not being helpful by keeping it to yourself. You need to air disagreement and come to some kind of view, even if it remains disagreement, at least to understand the, the structure of disagreement. And I think if we were more, if we could be more transparent and less combative about that, I think we might be able to get somewhere, but you know how you start with that, how you identify the people who are in various, I guess now camps of perspective on reality, how you get them together. I've read these uh, stories uh, in America about how, um, I, maybe they're sociologists or psychologists or something, I don't know, who've brought together groups of people who are from opposing political realities and, and putting them together and making them talk with each other and they wind up finding real connection and in some cases genuine friendship among people who fundamentally disagree about the world. That to me is okay, because that then you can get somewhere. But as long as you have a world where people don't talk to each other, that's very risky because you could you you flip from one to the other and you don't know, you just don't know where you're going. And I think flipping to either side 100 percent is a very bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think that it was a great ending <laughs> and uh, let's hope that uh, science and also the social science can help to, to create this kind of common reality yes. structure also so that we can engage in, in discourse and even uh, cherish a disagreement. Yes, exactly. It's yes. also only possible if you have a kind of common concept yes. of how the world works or looks like. And a little sense of humility. Yeah. <laughs> So again, I, I just want to thank you personally uh, for agreeing to doing this interview. I, this is one of the very uh, seldom interviews Arthur gives. I don't think if you ever have to give never, something like that. Never. So uh, we here, the, the whole team actually at the Austrian Central Bank in the Econ Lab is, is uh, very, very thankful to you uh, for doing this and, and of course also for supporting us all this year years producing the survey. Uh, as I said in the beginning, and actually I want to end with this, um, a lot of researchers with the, working with the HFCS should know that without Arthur, 
uh, their work would be possible. And I think it's um, a good idea to look at his uh, scientific work and take that, and I mean also um, in, in, a, in an ethical way, mm -hmm. as a standard, uh, because his work uh, uh, itself, I think, shows uh, how to, to be modest about claims and how to do meticulous uh, uh, research in the sense that uh, measurement and creating the world is, is really something uh, you were always aware of and uh, one can see that in all the papers of ours. So thank you so much. You're very welcome.